All right, we're in the book of Philippians. We've been in the book of Philippians for a little while. And if you've been around here, you know that it has taken us a few months slash years slash decades uh, to work our way through Philippians. We've occasionally thrown a few other series in the middle of this, but we're reaching the end of Philippians. And, uh, and we're talking about joy and, because that's kind of the keynote idea in the book of Philippians. And today, I want to take a few moments and talk about this concept and this idea. Idea. I want to talk about maximizing your receptivity. Uh, maximizing your receptivity. Everybody say, I am receptive. Good. Then you just don't even hardly need this message, but you might want to share this with somebody. Philippians 4, verse 9, just one verse I want to read today and take a few minutes and drill down on it. Philippians 4, 9. The Apostle Paul says this, the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul's big concept here is basically to tell the Philippian church, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, as, you, as you see the word of God being made flesh in me, I want you to follow that. I want you to, to, to take a hold of that and begin to put it into practice in your own life. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's one of the, the most important things to understand about who we surround ourselves with. Because as you find the Word of God being made flesh in people that are around you, it, it actually kind of picks up the possibilities of what you could experience in your life. Because as you look at them, you can, you can certainly go, gosh, if, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, I know what they're made of. I know they're made of the same dust and the same stuff that I'm made out of. And if they can do it, I can do it. And I just find that it's a powerful thing to get around somebody that has a spirit of faith. And there's something about when they carry a spirit of faith, it kind of is contagious. And it gets around, it gets on me when I'm around that. That's what Paul is saying. As you've seen it in me, as you've heard it in me, as you've observed it in me, as you've seen my example, uh, I want you to follow after that. The, the, the downside is, as well, when you, if, you, if you hang around too much cynical or doubters or negative or and whoever you hang around with, eventually you're going to find yourself kind of pulling down to their level and you're going to find yourself pulling up to the level of people that you hang around that are taking things higher than you're experiencing right now. And so, uh, so I find that when I see somebody really loving uh, and, and the word being made flesh in them in terms of the love of God, I have this tendency to just want to draw to it. I think every time I get around uh, our great friend, uh, Dr. David Shibley, uh, he so, has so much authority authority on his life, but he carries it in such a gracious way. Every time I get around him, I just, I, I want to become more gracious. And then that starts to wear off, and uh, then I need to get around him again. But, uh, but I'm always encouraged when I get around him. And so, you know, if you get around somebody who has really exhibited uh, a great level of perseverance, it just makes you go, I can do that. You know, I, I like that. I, I like what that feels like. I like what that smells like. I like being around that. When you're around somebody who has shown a great deal of courage or a great deal of determination or, or whatever positive thing, it can take you to a higher place. You know, we all watched in, in the world of sports, there are people that are constantly taking things higher, and as they take things higher, it seems to break a barrier for people to go to new levels. Uh, for years, no one could break the four-minute mile uh, barrier, but then Roger Bannister, I think it was either 1954, or 1956, somewhere in there, he broke through the four-minute mile, the first man to ever break through and run the mile in four minutes. But 
once he did it, once other people saw it, now high schoolers break through and run four-minute miles. There are all kinds of people that run four-minute miles. I'm just saying that when somebody breaks it through to another level and you get around them and you start to see, oh, these are the possibilities of life, it could take you to a higher place. And I find that it's, it's sometimes easy to, to, to hang around people who are not putting any uh, pressure on us, not that people would put pressure on us themselves, but it becomes easier to start to hang around with people who are not taking it higher because we don't feel threatened at all. We just sort of, ah, and yeah, we all need that kind of a thing in our life, but you got to have somebody in your world. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying, as you've seen it in me, as you've heard it in me, as you've seen my example, follow after this. You remember Dick Fosbury in, I think it was the 1968 Olympics, uh, was the first guy ever to do the Fosbury flop where he jumped over the high jump backwards and, and literally raised the bar for high jump some six inches. And, now, and then everybody began to do it. There's something so powerful about meeting people and getting around people who have gone higher and taken it further than you have. And, and I find that to, to, to find people who have gone further than me and who have taken it higher than me, uh, I've got to have an on-purpose uh, approach to getting into their world. Because normally, people who are going higher and taking it further are people that are pretty busy. Uh, they, they've, got, they've got a pretty full schedule. And, and to enter into their world and to begin to pick up on what makes them tick, I found that also it, it, there is a price to pay to get in their world. I mean, you can't, just, you can't just call up a person like that and say, could we just sit around and have a coffee? Because that's the last thing they really want to sit, sit around and do. You have to get into their world and say, I want to learn what makes you tick. I want to help you make it happen and get around them and start to watch them. And so that's why Suzette and I will often pay the price to, to get around other people and some you know, that are leading greater churches than our church and that are, that are taking things further and higher and faster than we're able to take them. And so we, sometimes we have to get on a plane and travel and get around people that are just doing uh, things you know, on a bigger level than us because I want to get around them. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to I want to smell it. I want to get close to it. And I find that when I do that, it enlarges the possibilities of my own life and, and helps me continually go for something higher. Could I just remind you of something that is so very basic but so very important? Your relationships are like elevators. They're either taking you up or they're taking you down. And, and I think it's worthwhile to evaluate your associations and make sure if, you, if you're the smartest person in the room all the time, you need to find another room. <laughs> I want to encourage you to, to ask God to, to seek out ways to upgrade your associations. And I'm not saying to do away with any relationships, although some of us probably could push delete on a few relationships and it wouldn't hurt a thing. I don't know, just stare straight ahead. Don't be looking at somebody sitting right next to you. So what Paul gives us here is he gives us four different um, avenues, four different ways that we can receive impact from another person's life. And the first way he gives us is, uh, he says, what you've learned from me. It's, it's the power of learning. Everybody say learning. And then he says, what you've received from me. That's the power of impartation. And then he says, what you've heard from me. That's the power of a sound. And then the fourth thing, he says, what you've seen in me. It's the power of an example. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's good to 
Check out your receptivity awareness today. Jesus said, Mark 4, verse 24, take care what you listen to. Because by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you and more will be given you besides. So if, if you are always listening to negative or calamity or cynical or doubting or political rhetoric, don't shout me down, um, if, take care, Jesus said, what you're listening to. Because whatever you're listening to, what you've got, you're going to have more of. And what you don't have, you're going to lose what you have. Jesus is saying, be careful how you listen. You know, I've, I've used this analogy a, a thousand times in here, but right now in this room, there are radio waves that are going across this room where you could be listening to country music or rock music or talk radio or opera or easy jazz and all those signals are always going out constantly but you can only hear what you tune into so if you're if you're turning into negativity central that's what you'll hear uh, if you if you're tuning into what's wrong in this world station then that's, that's what you're going to hear. If you start tuning into what are the possibilities with God in my world station, that changes everything. If you start, if you start tuning into there are great things happening through great people, there are great things happening in a, in a young generation, uh, if you're tuning into that station, guess what? What you tune into is what you can hear. I read a report the other day that was talking about because of the negativity of news, we could get the idea that the earth is more violent and there's more trouble than there's ever been. But the stats all show that globally, it's the most peaceful time we've had in hundreds of years. But, but all that's getting pushed forward is is here's war and here's the terrorist groups and here's guns shooting people and because that's what gets thrown, thrown at us on a regular basis. Jesus said, take care what you listen to. My, my car has a Sirius XM in it and, uh, and, and, the, and they give it to you free for the first three months and then after that, you have to start paying to have it enabled. Well, the truth is, I have the capacity to have Sirius XM in my car, but I can't catch any of those stations because it's not enabled. Receptivity has to be enabled. You got to turn it on. You got you to tune in to the right stuff. And that's what Paul is, is saying to these guys. And so I want to take a few minutes and walk through a couple of these things. Number one, he talks about the power of, of learning, what you've learned from me. The idea of learning uh, implies much more than you've gathered some knowledge. First, Second Timothy uh, 3, 7 says that there are some who are always learning but never able to actually come to the knowledge of the truth. And learning is a combination of knowledge and experience. Like you get the knowledge, but then you got to apply it. Darn, that's a big gap. Come on. Anybody ever read a book on losing weight but still find themselves God, anybody ever read a book on exercise? Yeah. Come on, be honest in church, and you know that you're not. 
Ain't nobody ever read a book on being nice to the other humans. Never mind. <laughs> and Jesus said, uh, Luke 11, verse 52, woe to you lawyers. Another, tr- another verse in, in one of the other gospels says, woe to you Pharisees, for you've taken away the key of knowledge, which is you yourselves did not enter. So he's, their thing was, you keep putting on people stuff you know but you don't do. Isn't that what religion loves to do? Right? You know, we're going to put on people to, you, got to, you should be doing this, but you, you took away the key of knowledge because you didn't enter in yourself. And when you've learned something in, in the Bible sense, it's in you. It's become a part of you. And what I've discovered through the years for myself as, as well as for most people in church life is you can, we can have heard of things for years but not actually do those things. We, we, we've heard a message on the power of words and the impact that they make, that words are a creative force, that words are not just for communication. The first use of words was not for communication. The first use of words was, was for creating. God said, let there be light. He wasn't communicating, he was creating. We've learned the power that life and death are in the power of the tongue. It's possible to go, oh, yeah, 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 that one. Ah, yeah, I heard that message. That was uh, joy number 11, I think. But it's possible to know that lesson, but still let negative words and bad conversation and negative talk about yourself or your situation or people you love keep coming out of your mouth. You you know the lesson, but you don't do it. Amen. Come on. We're all guilty of it. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just telling you, this is what can happen, right? You can, you, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're going to talk about the power of prayer. I, I believe in prayer. Prayer changes things. but you don't have a prayer life. You learn about the power of worshiping God right through the middle of everything because no matter what's happening negative in your world, God is still good. God is still worthy. Amen. He, he's still capable. And, but we can get so caught in the moment that here we are, instead of worshiping God, we're complaining about our situation. It's just a possibility. This may not even apply to anybody in this service. But all oh, that second service crowd needs to hear this bad. It's possible that, you know, somebody stands up here and says, yes, we're blessed to be a blessing. We go, yeah, but you're still entirely self-centered. <laughs> Amen. When you learn something, you actually know how it works. You, you're actually in it. You understand that God has a created order for everything, both spiritual and natural. And when you learn God's order for things, you can enter into the rest of God because you understand this is how God created it to work. So somebody stands up here and starts teaching on, okay, we're going to honor God with our first and our best. We're going to bring our tithe to the Lord. Now, the truth is, Suzette and I are never sitting there thinking, should we or shouldn't we? Because we've already learned to ride that bike. We've already, we've already learned how to do that. And because we've entered into it, now it's just, it's in us. It's part of us. It's not, just a, it's not just an idea. It's not just a concept. It's like learning how to ride a bike. Once you learn how to ride a bike, you don't even think about it anymore. You know, once you learn how to water ski, you're not thinking about it. You're just water skiing. Once you learn how to snow ski, you're not thinking about it. You're just snow skiing. And I think this, you know, the, this, is, this is the way we can understand the power of, of learning. 
Once, you know, you drive your car, the truth is you're not even thinking about it. You're just driving too fast down Monta Vista, <laughs> running into our exit sign. Yeah, just, that's just, no, you didn't do it, but somebody did. Here, here's what I want to at least encourage us to get a hold of. I'm talking about how to maximize your receptivity. You got you to gotta understand that there are some people who know things you don't know and that you can learn from other people. And just because you know about it doesn't mean you know it. Don't be a know-it-all. Come on, turn and tell your neighbor. Say, don't be a know-it-all. Come on. Turn and tell your neighbor, don't be a know-it-all. Be a learner. All right, second concept of how do do we maximize our receptivity is understand the power of impartation. He says, that which you've learned and received from me. I I like this idea. This is is a a pretty potent idea. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8 Uh, He says this, having thus a fond affection for you, we are well pleased to impart. Everybody say impart. To impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Romans 1 verse 11, he says, I long to see you in order that I may impart. Everybody say impart. That I might impart some spiritual gift to you so that you may be established. You receive impartation on a different level than you receive knowledge. You, impartation is more of a spirit thing. And he says, in Romans, he says, if I, sh- I wanna show up and I wanna impart to you from the spiritual gift that God has given to me. And so maximizing your receptivity, if you're gonna receive impartation, you're listening with a different set of ears. It, if you just come to church to intellectually analyze, you're going to miss the power of impartation. You're going to miss the gift that's on that church. Impartation is not just information, it's the, it's the spirit of a thing. Impartation will plant something in your spirit. And I want to encourage you, when you come to church, when you are in uh, whatever kind of meeting we're having, whether it's a Sunday morning meeting or Uh, a small group meeting or a prayer meeting or a mega worship time or whatever, that your receptivity is up for an impartation. Can you hear what I'm saying? What the difference, it's the spirit of a thing. And an impartation can can put in you a spirit of faith. Uh, An impartation can put increase inside of you. An impartation can take you from negative to positive. An impartation can affect the relationships in your life. An impartation, even though your head can't figure it out, you're going to recognize around this place anyway, God is for me. I don't understand everything about life, and I don't understand everything that's going on in my world right now, but you could get an impartation into your spirit to know God is for me. Come on. I'm encouraging you. This is how to maximize your receptivity. This is how to turn on Sirius XM. <laughs> you know, this is how to get the, the, the spiritual gift that's on a house. Anytime you're listening to any, anybody minister, whether it's your pastor or a guest minister or something that you're listening to, don't just analyze with your ears and your eyes, but open your spirit to receive an impartation. The third way 
uh, avenue of maximizing your receptivity is understand the power of a sound. He says that what you've learned, that you, what you've received, that you, what you've heard from me. Just curious, anybody in, in this meeting like Motown music? Come on, anybody like, come on, anybody like, what I mean is anybody saved, All right? Anybody like Motown, are you saved? Do you love Jesus? Uh, anybody like 80s music? Anybody like 70s music? Anybody like music? Yeah, yeah, right. Anybody never respond ever in church? Yeah. Me. Isn't it amazing how sounds define seasons? Sounds define eras. You can hear a song and go back to fourth grade like that. Right? You can, you can hear a, song, a sound and remember the first person you ever kissed. Okay, maybe not. Come on, there's the sound of victory. There's the sound of sorrow. There's the sound of life. It's a sound. There's a sound of defeat. And you can, you can hear a sound in the tone of somebody's voice. It's not just the words they're saying. There's a sound. You, you, can, you can hear compassion, the sound of compassion in the tone of somebody's voice. You can, you can hear a sound in music in attitude, in perspective, in the buzz. And I just want to say, every, every church has a sound. Our church has a sound. Rick Warren said, nothing defines a church more than its music. And I understand that the sound of our house is more than just the sound or style of our music. But I think it's important to understand that our music has to, on purpose, capture and project the sound of the house. And I'm, when I think about this, I think about this idea. You... And I, are, we're going to speak the sound we hear, right? When a person who can't hear well can't speak well. A, a, person, a person who was is, who is raised speaking English in the South we have a friend who was very southern, bordering on redneck, but I would never call him that, who, who was trying to learn Spanish. Hola, Isabel. Como esta? Estoy bien, gracias. I, I remember when Suzette and I lived in Europe, uh, in the early years of our marriage and, and trying to speak Danish. There were, there were sounds my mouth couldn't make trying to speak Danish because I hadn't grown up hearing that sound. And I, I'm just, I'm saying to you, if you're going to maximize your receptivity, you might want to clear out your ears a little and listen for the sound. And could I say this as well, is, you know, we get together in our church, and, and the, the sound of the house, it, of course it's happening during worship, but it's, it's the sound of everything that, that goes on around the house. 
And I just want to encourage you, if you love this place and, and you want to see us become and do everything that God has called for us to become and do, could I encourage you to be a contributor to the sound of the house? Like, like when, 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 when we are when we are all declaring the greatness of God and singing about He is the way, don't just stand there. Help create the sound You might say, well, pastor, you don't even know what I had to go through to get to church today. All the more reason to open your mouth and create the right sound. And then the last uh, avenue that I think could help us maximize our receptivity is to understand the power of an example. That what you've learned, that what you've heard, that's what, that what you've seen in me. Nothing Nothing impacts. The greatest power of leadership is the power of example. That's what leadership is ultimately. Leaders can't just say, you go there. Leaders have to say, follow me. Well, I go there. Leaders can't say, you go pray. Leaders have to, have to pray, right? Leaders can't just say, well, you should worship while they sit in a back room somewhere. No. When, and here's what I know. When I see excellence, I want excellence, you know, when I see love, I want love. When I see generosity, I go, oh, I want that. I think it's one of the reasons we should all continually aim higher and go to higher places is so that we can actually give example to people around us. Rather than, rather than you know, say, why don't you read, you know, somebody in your household, why don't you read your Bible more often? I promise you this, you start reading your Bible Paul says, practice these things. That's when the reality, he says, that what you've seen in me, that's what you've, what you've heard, that's what the example that I've set, I want you to start to put this into practice. I want you to try. You could read a book about driving a car, you could watch a video about driving a car, you could watch somebody else drive a car, but eventually you got to get your hands on the wheel and drive and I want to say everybody starts everywhere as a beginner sometimes you just got to take the step and go into it it's like I, you know I would love to pray pastor but I don't know how here's how pray I, I, don't, I don't even know if I know how to serve how, here's how you learn serve. Take the risk, take the step to put it into practice and overcome your fear of looking like a rookie because you are a rookie and that's okay because everybody's a rookie somewhere at any point. I want to pray with you. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Come on, I want... Here's what I'm encouraging us as a church. Let's, let's stay learners. Let's receive impartation. Let's listen for a sound. Let's learn from great examples. Father, I pray for maximized receptivity in our lives. Let us hear. Let us receive. Let us learn from the great people you put around us. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I just want to take this moment. Have you ever really received Jesus into your world? And I know sometimes there's apprehension to go, I don't even know if I could do all that. I don't even know if I could keep up. I don't even know if I have what it takes. Hey, listen, it's just one step at a time. It's just starting as a, as a rookie, starting as a baby. It's just opening your heart and recognizing. 
Maybe you're here today, you've never really just surrendered to Jesus. Or maybe you're here today and you, in fact, used to walk with the Lord, but you are not where you want to be, used to be. You know you could be a place you know you should be. I want to encourage you to come back home today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I just feel unsure about where I stand with God. I just want to take a minute. You've never given your life to Christ. Or maybe you've fallen away from him. Maybe you feel unsure, but you say, I want to receive Jesus as Lord of my life. Would you? I want to pray with you. I just want you to lift your hand and say, that's me. And I want you to signal not just me, but I want you to signal to the Lord. Just say, I need Jesus. Anybody else? Just want to raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Come on, anybody? Just say, I just I need to take the first step. I just need to open my heart to receive Jesus. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's pray this prayer together. This is for all who lifted their hands, but I'd love for us to all pray this together. Everybody say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to receive you, to receive your love, to receive your lordship. I know I've sinned. I know I've messed up, and I'm sorry. I come to the cross where you've paid the price for my forgiveness. Today is a fresh start, a new beginning, as I receive Jesus as my Lord. Help me become the person you created me to be. Amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord. Amen.